So we're moving into this chapter, uh, chapter 5. It's the first lecture of three lectures on what we call the second law of thermodynamics. Um, this chapter is a lot different than the other chapters in most textbooks, most thermodynamics textbooks, but even most like statics, dynamics textbooks. One, it's very conceptual. So the first time you look at it and read it, it's like, what? Where's the plug and chug? I need the plug and chug. It's very conceptual. Plug and chug comes in chapter 6. Chapter 6 is uh, the entropy and using entropy to describe or construct a balance to quantify the second law of thermodynamics. You don't have to use entropy for the second law of thermodynamics. It's just convenient and traditional that we use a new property called entropy. But before we get to entropy, we've really got to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. It is impossible for a process or a system to violate the first law of thermodynamics. Do you agree with that? Is that true or is that false? It is impossible for a system or a process to violate the first law of thermodynamics. What do you think? It's true. It's true. All right, but even if a system obeys the first law of thermodynamics, it still may not be possible. It may be impossible. You may dream it up on paper and then check it. Oh, does it violate the first law of thermodynamics? Hey, if you dreamt it up on paper, but it violates the first law of thermodynamics, don't try and build it. It won't work. But even if you dream it up on paper and it, you check it, it does not violate the first law of thermodynamics, it still could not be realizable. It could still be impossible because there's another law. It's the second law of thermodynamics. What were the statements as a reminder about the first law? Well, energy is conserved. That's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's good. There's another way of saying it. All these are engineering thermodynamics textbooks. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only altered in form. We can convert energy between forms, but we can't create it or destroy it. And then here's a longer definition or description of the first law of thermodynamics, but I think you get the gist. You get the gist of that. Here's an introduction to the second law of thermodynamics. I'm going to pose a problem that we can solve and then we'll talk about, is this possible or not possible? And your experience will help guide you on this. Think about a block of material, call it block A. And then you also have a block of material, block B. And material A starts off with initial temperature of A of 300 Kelvin, and the initial temperature of B is 500 Kelvin. And I could put the mass and specific heat, but let me do the product of the mass and the specific heat because both of these are just solid chunks of material. And let's say that's one kilojoule per Kelvin and the mass specific heat for block B, that's for block A, that's for block B, is two kilojoules per Kelvin. Either you think block B has a larger mass or a larger specific heat. But the product of MC for block B is twice that for block A. All right. We put them in a thermal con contact. First law. It starts TA at, at the temperature of A is 300, temperature B is 500. After some time, I'm not going to let it go to complete thermal equilibrium, but I put them into thermal contact. What do you think the temperature of one is going to do? go up a little bit, and the temperature of 2 is going to come down a little bit. And so you could predict that by the first law, it would give you something like the MC for material A times the final temperature of A minus the initial temperature of A. That's like how much heat is transferred into A. MC for B, the final temperature of B minus the initial temperature of B, the final temperature of B will be less, so it's going to be typically this term right here is negative because the fine T, T2 of B is less than T1 of B. True? So you can see, yeah, that's the first law. We solve problems like that. All right. Let's take a look at uh, this case. 
where I say at the end of the process, the T2 of B is 400 Kelvin, and T2, oops, T2 of A is 400, and T2 of B is 450 Kelvin. Look okay? Or, let's say I say, no, it goes a little further. T2 of A is hotter. At the final temperature of A is not, it doesn't stop at 400. It stops at 450 Kelvin. And uh, T2 of B is whatever gives you out of this equation, which I think I calculated to be 75 minus <clears throat> 425 Kelvin. Kelvin. Somebody want to check that? Is this both of these cases? Obey the first law? I think they're both correct. But what do you think about this one? <clears throat> you think it's physically realizable? From your experience in this world, is this physically realizable or not? This is what we call possible. What about this one? <clears throat> It's impossible. Okay, why? Uh, it violated the first law of thermodynamics. No, it didn't. No, it did not. Why? Well, somehow after this one had heated up and T2 temperature continues to rise, somehow the, the final temperature of B ended up lower than the final temperature of A. <coughs> A kept heating up and B kept cooling down. That doesn't make sense. All right. That one's pretty easy to see. Let's talk about a compressor. We've studied compressors before. We have an inlet state 1 to this compressor, and we have an outlet state 2 to this compressor. We have to feed a positive power or work per unit mass into the compressor, and it's going to be H2 minus H1. <laughs> So I'm not going to test you on violating the first law, although you should routinely check to see if energy is conserved or if there's a violation of the first law. But for a well-insulated compressor, if I know the inlet enthalpy and the exit enthalpy, then I know how much work I put in neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy, and it's running at steady state. Well, we're bringing in refrigerant 134A, that saturated vapor at a pressure of 2.8 bar. If I told you, okay, it's going to go out at a pressure 2 of 12 bar and a temperature 2 of 50 degrees C, you'd say, well, that looks reasonable, pressure went up. Or it could go out at pressure P2 of 14 bar, because I made some changes in my design, and the temperature 2 came out at 60 degrees C, Either one of these, both of them I could compute and say, well, the work that the compressor, it needs to be, you need to supply the work to the compressor for this case would be around 29 kilojoules per kilogram of refrigerant flowing through it. And for this case, it would need to be about 36 kilojoules per kilogram. All look good? One of these cases is possible and one is not possible. Can you tell which one? <coughs> Not really. Not really. You just have to be a guess and you'd have a 50-50 chance, right? But there's nothing to tip your hand to say which one is possible, which one's impossible. But if later when we uh, explore and use the property entropy, we'll find that this one is impossible and this one's possible. How? Magic? No, no. Second law of thermodynamics. Well, that's the value of it. There's another one that we can do. So what I have is I have nitrogen flowing into and out of a nozzle. The nozzle comes in state 1 of 340 Kelvin and a pressure 400 kilopascal and a velocity of 20 meters per second. Look reasonable. It comes out. Somebody says, oh, I claim that it comes out at 330 Kelvin. 350 kilopascal and 145.5 meters per second. All right. 
Somebody else says, no, I think it comes out 320 Kelvin, 350. Uh, hold it, this is uh, Kelvin, this is kilopascal, and uh, 204.8 meters per second. This second case, you can't tell. I can't tell unless I do a little digging and quantitative analysis of the second law, but this case is truly not possible. You can't be realized. This one, it's possible. You can have the steam turbine where the inlet is fixed for two cases and you're interested in the outlet. Okay, so for both cases, we'll say that pressure inlet 8,000 kilopascal, high pressure. Temperature inlet 540 degrees C. Then we'll take look at two cases for the outlet. The final pressure is 1,000 kilopascal and it comes out saturated vapor at 1,000 kilo, or the final pressure is 200 kilopascal, lower, and it comes out saturated vapor. In both cases, the purpose of this well-insulated steam turbine neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy is to generate shaft power, and so we'll talk about the power out of the turbine in lowercase w, so how many kilojoules of work, shaft work, come out per kilogram of mass flow through is equal to the inlet enthalpy minus the exit enthalpy. And in both cases, I can say, oh, the work of this is 720.4 kilojoules per kilogram, and the work of for the turbine for the lower pressure, 200 kilopascal, 791 kilojoules per kilogram. Both obey the first law. Energy is conserved. One I picked is possible. The other I picked is impossible. Can you tell? Could you guess? Who wants to be really brave and guess which one they suspect is impossible? This one right here or this one? The lower one? The one that gets more work out per steam? Yeah, I know, and this is one of those nasty questions faculty should be not allowed to ask. They set you up, right? It's like every indication, hey, you're getting more work out. That's probably harder to do from the steam. Ah, probably that's the impossible case. But the second law isn't always so obvious. And it comes in that this one is the impossible, and this one is possible. You can get more work out if you go to a lot lower pressure. Yes. No, this is uh, 8,000 kilopascal. The critical pressure is 22 something megapascal, 22,000 kilopascal. So we're. Yeah, this one, the temperature, if you looked at the saturation temperature for 1,000 Kelvin or 1,000 kilopascal, I think it's 180 degrees C at 200 kilopascal. I didn't write it down. Is it around 50, 60? Is that low? Mm, not, at, not at 200 kilopascal. No, it's, it's over 100 degrees. Yeah, two bar. Yeah, it's 120. So it's 120 degrees C, the, the temperature, the exit. But sometimes the second law, not so obvious. Well, this uh, limitation on the transformation of energy between forms has been the focus of study for quite some time. Back at the beginning of the steam engines, back in the early 1800s, he wasn't the first person to think about this, but Sadi Carnot, a French military engineer, looked at these steam engines where you're able to burn something and able to lift something or push something or turn something, and wow, this is great. <laughs> Never been done before. We're able to burn something and do mechanical work. 
You wanted work done before the Industrial Revolution? How did you get it done? Animal muscle or human muscle? That was it. Animal muscle or human muscle? That's it. So this whole thing about having a machine where you're going to burn something, well, i got to back up a little bit. They started to have water wheels, and they'd take the energy out of a river, a flowing river, with that water wheel. Then they could turn something. But really, to burn something, to turn something or lift something was brand new. So anyway, they started thinking about, so he wrote this book in 1824, Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. Reflections. I'm just going to think and ponder about the motive power, hey, making something move, mechanical power, and coming from where? Burning something, fire. It makes sense. The title makes sense. This book was lost for a long time, but uh, some people went and dug and found it, and they actually, you can get a reprint or read it now probably online. I know Dover, Dover Publications published it for many years. It's a French translation to English. A um, couple things of interest. Uh, how long did this person live? <laughs> Not long enough. And at what age did he write the basically the book that's remembered and passed down for 100 years or more, more than 100 years? Like 28 or something. So an interesting little sidebar there. It's a little note. Um, he died of some epidemic uh, that went through cholera or something. Well, they started talking about these heat engines. So what is a heat engine? It's a device to produce the motive power from heat. Well, how do we analyze it? Typically, we put a little heat engine here, and we think, oh, it's going to be running in a cycle, so it can be running continuously. And what's happening is there's some heat being brought into it. Maybe I'm bringing some rate of heat transfer in from some high temperature. How did you get that high temperature? Well, you're burning something. Okay? You're burning something, and then that's transferring energy into some parts of this working uh, system. And the goal is to get some power out, mechanical power out. And you would think that that's the end of the story, but it's not quite the end of the story because when you have heat transfer, you have to have a low temperature sink for heat to throw away some waste heat. And so what happens is you have to have some Q dot L out to low temperature. So you talk about the heat engine, purpose, convert, heat transfer into mechanical or work transfer and you then have to think about these thermal reservoirs what's a reservoir something that's so large that even if you take a little heat out of it the temperature stays constant at th or it's so large that even though you dump a little heat into it the temperature stays constant all tl we have a contest okay Let's see who can go outside and change the temperature of uh, San Antonio's weather today by exhaling a big breath of hot air. You think you're going to accomplish much? No. Exhale all you want. Weather station's just going to report the temperature what it is. Now, it could change from winter to summer, and it does, but basically it's not controlled by my little exhaling. Did I pump heat into the atmosphere outside when I exhaled? Sure. Energy is conserved, but it didn't change the temperature of a big thermal reservoir. Clausius, a German physicist engineer living in these years, published, he was thinking about the same thing in 1851, a book, and he did many papers, many, he's, he's also one of the great founders of uh, thermodynamics, just like uh, uh, Carnot, you know, the, the mechanical theory of heat. See what they're trying to do? Burn something, heat transfer to turn something, lift something, push something. Okay? Mechanical theory of heat. Well, he came out with what today we claim is a statement of the second law. So, hey, you want the second law of thermodynamics? Here it is. This is one of those unappealing things to students. Taught this class enough. They're in chapter five. 
I want plug and chug. I want plug and chug. Well, this is not really plug and chug, but here it is. Clausius' statement of the second law of thermodynamics says, it is impossible for any system to operate in such a way that the sole result would be an energy transfer by heat from a colder to a hotter body. Hmm. So I have a hot body and I have a cold body and I have a system that's not going to be getting something from the exterior and that system, the only thing it's going to do is it's going to transfer heat from the low temperature to the high temperature. It's going to, that's impossible. That's Clausius' statement. Here's another statement of it from another engineering thermodynamics textbook. Heat will not flow from a cold object to a hot object without the expenditure of external work. Now, if somebody puts in external work into a system, guess what? That's a refrigeration system. Clever engineers and developers develop that. And you enjoy it and benefit from it. Air conditioning systems in your automobile, in your car. But without that external power or work coming in, there is no just heat flow from cold objects to hot objects. Here's another way of saying it. It's impossible for a self-acting machine unaided by any external agency to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. You can get heat to go uphill, but you've got to put a lot of work and be clever about it. All right. That's a statement of the second law of thermodynamics. There's other people that worked in thermodynamics. Lord Kelvin, is he the same reason that we have the Kelvin temperature scale? To honor him, sure is. The Kelvin temperature scale after Lord Kelvin, whose birth name was William uh, Thompson. Uh, he's English, Scottish scientist. These are the years that he lived. Also, German, Max Planck. He won the Nobel Prize in 1918. These are the years that he lived. Notice he lived over two great events in history. One and two, that's right. Thought, think about that. I think he lost a son or two in those wars. I think his family was pretty well decimated, but I don't recall. I remember looking at it, but I didn't refresh my memory on that. But it's hard to be a German, live through two world wars, and not have your family impacted. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, they worked in this area of thermodynamics and struggled with this concept of converting energy between forms, and they also were able to come out with a statement, not working together, but it's similar statement, so they attribute it to both of these people and say, look, this is the second statement, the Kelvin-Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Well, what does it say? It is impossible for any system to operate in a thermodynamic cycle and deliver a net amount of energy by work to its surroundings while receiving energy by heat transfer from a single thermal reservoir. This is the dream of so many engineers. I have some hot source. I'm going to have a very clever heat engine. That engine is going to operate in a cycle. It's going to ingest a heat transfer from that hot. And guess what it's going to do? It'll put out work. And what have I eliminated? The wasteful throwing away of trash heat transfer to the low temperature reservoir. I'm a good engineer. They studied this and studied this because this would be a great dream come true. And they concluded, nope, it's impossible. It's not possible to do that. Here's another statement. Keenan in 1941 said, it's impossible to construct an engine which will work in a complete cycle, meaning for a little bit, if it's just a process, it can do it, but it, to work in a cycle and produce no effect except to raise a weight. <laughs> I love this terminology. Raise a weight. That's a clever way of saying doing work, external work. You can hook this up to a pulley like that and then raise your weight in a gravitational field. You'll find the engineering thermodynamic literature full of that terminology. And exchange heat with a single <coughs> reservoir. Here's another one, 53 short. It's impossible by means of inanimate material agency to derive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of surrounding objects. 
you could say the same thing in so confusing a way. But no, this guy, Short, was a great uh, professor at UT Austin in the 40s and 50s uh, in, in the area of mechanical engineering thermodynamics. So that's why one of the reasons I have his book and I pull things out of it every now and then. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about reversible processes, irreversible processes, sources of irreversibilities, and then we'll get to trying to quantify the second law. So what's a reversible process? Well, it consists of a bunch of equilibrium states such that you could stop it right in the middle of the process and it would be okay. It would stay right there. And you can make it go forward or go backwards by little infinitesimal urgings. It'll, it'll go back to where it started from or it can go proceed to the end of a process. A process is also, think about it this way, is reversible if the system and all of its elements in the environment around the surroundings can be completely restored to the respective initial states after the process has occurred. So the test is, I think about a diagram, it's easy to think about a process going from initial state one to final state two, maybe on a PV diagram. And then I ask the question, is the process one to two reversible? Well, the way you answer the question is you ask another question. You say, is the reverse process 2 to 1 possible? If it's possible, then the original process was reversible. If the backward process is not possible, hence it's impossible, then the forward process, <laughs> the original process, was irreversible. Irreversible processes. We have a lot of them out there in, in, the, uh, in practice. Well, really no processes are completely reversible. Everything has a little friction. Everything, if there's a heat transfer, has a little temperature difference to drive that heat transfer. And if there's an expansion like that, an unrestrained expansion, all three of these are sources of irreversibilities. There's more. If you have a chemical mixing, if I just have two containers, pure substance A, pure substance B, I open a, a valve in between them, there's mixing, very irreversible. Okay. Uh, there's other processes, but these are the big ones. If you said what causes irreversibilities, number one on the list, friction. Number two on the list, heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. The larger the temperature difference, the more irreversible the heat transfer for the same amount of heat. And then this expansion, this unrestrained expansion to a lower pressure, irreversible. I hesitate to give you some of these definitions, but let me just give them to you. Please read the textbook. I know it takes a couple times to go over things to put it into your brain, but there's a difference between where the irreversibility occurs. It could be internal to the system or external. Sometimes it helps us to say, oh, the source of the irreversibility is external to the system. So if you have internal irreversibilities, they occur within the system. If they're external, they occur outside in the surroundings, but often in the immediate surroundings. And often it's because of heat transfer with a finite temperature difference, something like that. Okay. Carnot corollaries. Well, we have a couple corollaries. Let's go through them. We have the thermal efficiency of an irreversible power cycle is always less than the thermal efficiency of a reversible power cycle when they operate between the same two thermal reservoirs. Think about a big high temperature reservoir in a big low temperature reservoir, TL and TH, okay? So I take a system that's operating in a cycle, and the purpose is it's a power cycle, so it wants to produce work. And I'm going to intake some Q sub H and reject some Q sub L. What's the thermal efficiency by definition out of what, chapter two for that? Remember that thermal efficiency for a power cycle? What we want, what we want work divided by what we have to supply to make it work is QH. We have to throw away QL. We'd like to minimize QL, but hey, 
we have to throw it away. Now, if I have this system and it's completely reversible, it has an efficiency for completely reversible. If I operate between the same high temperature and the same low temperature to this cycle, but this one's an irreversible power cycle, guess what? The efficiency of the irreversible, oh, it's still defined as W over QH. It always has that definition, but you'll have a lower W than you did with the reversible system and a higher QL compared to the reversible system. Hence, the thermal efficiency of the reversible is greater than the thermal efficiency of the irreversible. That's this Carnot corollary. Anytime you start introducing irreversibilities, the efficiency of a power cycle goes down. You can't introduce some irreversibilities and expect it to go up, even if you're a super clever person. Next Carnot corollary. All the reversible power cycles operating between the same two thermal reservoirs have the same thermal efficiency. So somebody, I know I didn't leave enough room here, but I come in with a new design for a reversible <laughs> heat engine, and it intakes QC, QH, and it rejects QL. Guess what? If it's completely reversible and the other one's completely reversible, they have a different design inside, a different design inside, but they're going to have the same efficiency. For design one, we'll have the same thermal efficiency, reversible design two. As long as you have the same two thermal reservoirs. You start changing the high temperature or low temperature, well, it's adjusted. You can do the same thing for refrigeration and heat pump cycles. Do you recall, let's say uh, this is my TH here, and this is my TL here, and I put a system in here, and the goal is not to produce power, but to consume power in order to draw heat from the low temperature and dump it to the high temperature. You remember that for the heat pump as well as refrigeration? What's the coefficient of performance for refrigeration cycle? In general, it's defined as QL divided by the work supplied. What is the coefficient of performance for the heat pump? Recall, QH divided by W supplied. True? Well, it's the same type of thing as you say, the coefficient of performance, whether it's refrigeration or heat pump, is going to be greater if it's reversible than the coefficient of performance for refrigeration or heat pump if it's irreversible. And if you have two systems that are completely reversible, then guess what? They have the same COPs. There's a thing called a perpetual motion machine. You may have heard that terminology. It's, uh, you, you, you can find that a number of patents have been rejected, or patent applications have been rejected by the United States Patent Trademark Office because they claim that it's a perpetual motion machine. So let's cover the perpetual motion machine of the first kind and a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. So let's see, perpetual motion machine, it's not going to be possible to implement or build a perpetual motion machine. That's why the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office says we reject your patent because you, you can't build it. It violates laws of thermodynamics. But uh, here is one right here that's a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. And let me just describe it. We have water in a tank at high elevation, and we have a water wheel that takes that water and brings it down, and as that water is coming down the water wheel and flowing into the lower tank, it generates a torque on that water wheel that rotates a shaft that we have hooked up to an electric generator. Looks good so far. The electric generator puts out power, electric power, and we go and we sell this electricity. But we have to use some of that electricity 
to make the system continue to go continuously in the loop. So we'll tap off some electricity, not all of it, to come back to an electric motor to drive a pump. What's the water pump do? Well, it takes the water out of the lower tank and pumps it up to the higher tank. That's my design, and I'd like you to invest $50,000 each in it. And I'm, I'll take your checks now, because we'll be rich. But why is this a perpetual motion machine of the first kind? What laws of thermodynamics, either the first or the second, does it break? Conservation of energy. So what you have to do is, using the tools you know, draw a big control volume. Usually that's what happens with these machines. Draw a big control volume, okay? From the perspective of that big control volume, the water is just going inside. Is the water cutting across the boundary? No. Is the shaft work of the water wheel? No, it's all inside. All right, what cuts across? Free electricity. You just, just here it comes. Just, is that going to work? Continuously going to provide electricity out of that system? No. That's why it violates the first law of thermodynamics. Just write down the first law for this closed system, right? It's a closed system. <laughs> the rate of change of energy inside that system is equal to the rate at which is heat transferring in. There's none. Minus the rate at which work is coming out. I'm saying work coming out in electric form. There's no mass. It can't continuously supply electricity for nothing. All right. Now, here's another design. I'm going to uh, just focus on this top part right here. But it's a perpetual motion machine, what we're going to do uh, of the second kind. It'll violate the second law of thermodynamics. First of all, this top half works. So don't be too afraid of that. What we're going to have is a boiler, a turbine, a condenser, and a water pump. Now, I don't know why I wrote that right there twice. Get rid of that. Uh, the boiler takes in some heat. Boils some water, the water goes through the turbine, produces some power, the steam comes out low pressure, you condense it, you put it to a pump to get it back to high pressure, and away you go. This system works. This is a vapor power system running power plants all over the world. The net power out will be what you get out of the turbine minus what has to go back to drive the pump. Okay. But an engineer where a lot of designers look at this and they say, where is the waste? Right here. <clears throat> Why is that wasteful? You're throwing valuable energy out into the lake and air and rivers and just dumping it to the atmosphere. Bad, bad, bad on you. So what they do is a lot of people say, I'm a clever engineer. You're, you, you wouldn't be the first one to come up with this one. And they say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a heat exchanger and get rid of that wasteful condenser. So this, this turbine right here, this fluid, needs to be condensed. I need to get heat out of it. Take some heat out of it. Dump it to the atmosphere. But I don't want to dump it to the atmosphere. I'm going to dump it up here to the water that's going to go into the boiler. I'll preheat the water going into the boiler with the waste heat that would normally be rejected in the condenser. Hence, good job. Money. All right. So this right here, this redesign, getting rid of the condenser, is a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. And we only know the Clausius statement of thermodynamics or the Kelvin-Planck statement of thermodynamics. Which of them does it violate and why? The Kelvin-Planck. And so what you do is you draw a big control volume and you say, look it, I have one heat transfer in and one power out and no other heat transfer to another thermal reservoir? Impossible. Save your money. Don't invest. It won't work. All right. So perpetual motion machine of first and second kind. Uh, John Keeley. A carpenter, a mechanic in the Philadelphia area, lived in these, these years, 1837 to 1898. Uh, you can see a whole website and view all of his uh, very interesting 
hydro pneumatic pulsating vacuum engine, which make a lot of power, put a lot of oil companies right out of business. Well, that's why we don't have any oil companies today. Those thieves were put out of business by this man. They had, come on now. He had this machine, and he got a lot of money from investors over the years and over the years. He finally died. I think somebody, as I understand the story, uh, bought his house and tore it up, and they found a big, huge pressure vessel stored somewhere in the basement, hidden away, that he would initially pull a big vacuum on and then use that as the thing to make it work two floors above when he wanted to demo it to the investors. You can read more about it. But uh, what you want to do is you want to be armed uh, in thermodynamics, knowing that energy is very expensive. People will pay a lot of money for a gallon of gas. You're, you're just living it up because it's only, what, two-something gallon? When it was Ford, did you buy about the same amount? Most people bought about the same amount of gas when it was four a gallon. When it goes to eight, you're going to buy the same amount? Some people will. When it goes to $12 a gallon, people, there's a huge cash flow in, in energy. It's huge. It's huge. So anyway, uh, when there's a huge cash flow, there's also a huge incentive to uh, make claims. Well, to improve the system, efficiency, that's good, but also to maybe abuse the system by getting people to invest in your scheme. Oh, I went out to web YouTube and I wanted to run my car on water. What do you think? You think anybody out there on YouTube's got the scheme how to run your car on water? They're super rich. When I first, when the internet first came out, I'd show that. I'd even go to video clips somebody in Philippines. But he's been since murdered by the oil companies. Sorry about that. <laughs> but he would take your $10,000 investments and run your car on water. So has anybody ever seen any of these? Do you know as soon as you graduate and you have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, you're going to have some friends at a cocktail party? Oh, what you, oh you took thermodynamics. What are you learning? Hey, I have some questions. You ever heard of the second law of thermodynamics? You'll get pinned. Tell, it'll happen. They want to know. There's a lot of friends of mine. They have a lot of questions. Why can't I just put oil in my car and run it? I mean, water in my car and run it. This guy, he's in Florida. He's doing it. This guy in the Philippines is doing it. Why, why do you guys not at the university do something important? <laughs> so anyway, uh, these are the types of claims that hopefully we become equipped with because this whole chapter is, it's possible. It's impossible. It satisfies or obeys the first law of thermodynamics. It satisfies or obeys the second law of thermodynamics or it doesn't. See? All right. Well, this is a long derivation. Let me see if I can jump to a cleaner slide on this. And let me give you this derivation in Cliff Notes version. Because we want to come up with some phenomenally important result. There it is in the red box. It says for a reversible cycle, a reversible system, the heat transfer into it and out of it, the ratio is proportional to the ratio of the temperature at which it's coming in and out. That's what's in the red box. The ratio of Q's is equal to the ratio of T's, but they have to be an absolute temperature scale, the Kelvin temperature scale for SI. How do we do this? Well, we start off and we have a heat engine. And we just remind ourselves, high temperature, low temperature, Q in, H, Q L out, work. We know that thermal efficiency eta is work over Q H. And then we can replace the work by Q H minus Q L from the first law, conservation of energy. So we get that the thermal efficiency is simply 1 minus Q L over Q H, just a little algebra. And then you think. What is the thermal efficiency of a heat engine depend on then? There's only two things it really depends on. 
It depends on how hot the heat source is that you're getting the thermal energy from and how cold the thermal reservoir is for the sink of thermal energy. That's all it depends on. So this may be almost like, what? But think about it. The thermal efficiency is only a generic function of TH and TL. That's it. All right, now, this is all for a reversible heat engine. So what you say is, if that's equal to 1 minus QL over QH, then QL over QH has to be not the same function, so we change it from G to F, but a different function, but it's only a function. The ratio of Qs is only a function of TL and TH. That's a big leap. Those are two big steps, right? More than big steps. Now we do this. Consider a different, slightly different case. There's the same TH and there's the same TL, but we put in an intermediate TM. It's kind of a thermal reservoir that really doesn't, what it absorbs, it also gives up. And so we put this heat engine in between. So Q1 comes out, which that's same as QH, and to this heat engine, and then some energy is produced by that heat engine. So less Q2 goes out and goes into TM, but Q2 goes also into the second heat engine, which produces some work. And then finally, Q3 is the QL that goes out. Hopefully that makes sense. All three of these now, heat engines are reversible. And so you could say, well, we already deduced that Q2 over Q1 is a function of the two temperatures, TM and TH. YM, the intermediate temperature, the middle temperature, TH, the high temperature. And then the same thought, you say the ratio of Qs, Q3 to Q2, is only a function of TL and TM. I know we lost you by there, but hey, it's, it's just straightforward logic. And then you just think about algebra. Forget about all this other stuff. Is Q3 over Q1 equal to Q2 over Q1 times Q3 over Q2? Because the Q2s cancel. And then we just said, hey, you know what this is? Q2 over Q1, that's a function of TM and TH. And you know what Q3 over Q2 is? That's a function of TL over TM, not TL over TM, but TL and TM. And you know what Q3 over Q1 is? Isn't that QL over QH, which was only a function of TL and TH? So what I have is I have a function of TL and TH equal to the multiplication of a function of TM and TH times a function of TL and TM. How is that going to work? The only way that works is if the TMs cancel. The TMs must cancel. So you look at this and somebody proposed, well, the way to make this work is you have a function of one of the temperatures divided by a different function of the other temperature. They split. The numerator is controlled by maybe TM, the denominator by TH. When that goes, those two phi's cancel, and you're left with phi TL over phi TH. And then Lord Kelvin was looking at this problem, scratching his head, and he proposed, hey, why don't we just do this? Why don't we get a very simple function of the temperature? The simplest function I know is the temperature itself. But it has to be a particular temperature scale, absolute temperature scale. Hence, we name it absolute temperature scale Kelvin. The bottom line is the ratio of Qs for a reversible heat engine can be replaced by the ratio of absolute temperatures. Last, last slide, but I do have two minutes. So what did we say for the heat engine efficiency? 1 minus QL over QH. If it's reversible, reversible. We'll t talk about the Carnot efficiency, the Carnot heat engine, the best heat engine. And that can be replaced by 1 minus TL over TH. And this is probably one of the simplest and most powerful equations in our thermodynamics textbook. What you can do is plot the thermal efficiency. Maybe start at 300 Kelvin for the cold or low temperature. 
So as the high temperature goes up, the thermal efficiency naturally goes up. And this explains a lot of reasons where the engineers have been pushing and pushing, especially early in the Industrial Revolution, increase the temperature of the working fluid in the system. Get the steam pressure and temperature way up. It's great for efficiency. We're still on that, and you'll see that in power cycles where they're still doing it. But this equation plotted shows you that general trend. This equation, I can almost guarantee you, will be on your FE exam and the EIT exam. You just have to know what it is and know how to use it. It's a very quick one or two minute question. Answer it and away you go. We'll explore more of it later. Thank you very much for your attention. Done.